so today we have the finale the epic conclusion. The epic conclusion. I'm, I'm very so excited. excited. Yeah, so this is part three of our interview with James Baylock. And so if you're listening and you have no idea what we're talking about, uh, we highly suggest you go back just a few days at this point uh, and listen to parts one and two of our three-part series. That's right. So, so far we've heard James talk about, you know, how he got started as a photographer, how his career took off, some of the more extreme situations he's been in, some of the challenges he's faced. And today he's going to talk about some of the people that he's worked with throughout his career and kind of his own role in becoming an activist in, for climate change. I'm interested about your, um, you do these uh, like films that have obviously like a message and there's usually some sort of like a call to action. What types of responses do you get from from people like for example I know for um, Chasing Ice there's I don't know if you've seen this but there's this reaction of this woman who it's like she is like she says in a video like I'm a Bill O'Reilly supporter I'm a conservative all of this and like this has changed my life and like we we use this in communications trainings workshops I wonder if maybe not to that degree or maybe so but I wonder like what types of reactions you've had to your films uh, or if you have any like that are noteworthy we get a lot of reactions just like that. And that, that recording of that woman, we refer to that as L.A. Woman after the old Doors song, you know, L.A. <laughs> woman. Da, 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 da. Um, and she was outside a theater in L.A. after a screening of Chasing Ice, and she was literally in tears saying, I, 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 I had no idea about the truth of this. I, everything I knew about climate change I got from listening to Bill O'Reilly. And I used to throw people out of dinner parties at my house when they would when they would go talking about climate change. And now I can see that I need to apologize, that I was wrong, and now I get the truth of it. And I, we've had a lot of comments like that. I had a guy who, um, according to his daughter, has laid more miles of oil and gas pipeline than anybody in the American West. He was in a show I did at the University of Utah, this very rangy kind of Western guy with a John Deere cap on and a denim jacket and, and dusty cowboy boots came up to me afterwards, he was probably early 70s, mid 70s, and he said, young man, now I understand. And I believe this evidence from what you're showing me. You seem like a sensible guy, you seem like a credible guy, I get it now. And I had never heard any of this before. I've had that from lots of people. Now, of course, the people who walk out of the room and go, ah, he's an idiot, I don't believe a word he says, I don't hear from him, <laughs> from them. Sure. But let me tell you another story. At the end of the human element, there is a, there is a whole storyline that happens where we pivot to eastern Kentucky, which is right in the heart of coal mining country in Kentucky. And there are two guys, Adam Edelin and uh, Ryan Johns, who uh, are entrepreneurs, and they have this great desire to take a mountaintop that has been mined for strip mining and turn it into a place where they're going to put a solar panel farm, 100,000 100, solar panels to generate electricity. That's their big idea. New energy in the heart of coal country in Kentucky. And Ryan works for a coal company. You know, it's not like he's a hippie from Sierra Club coming in. He's like one of the local boys, been there for five generations. So he wants to have solar energy in the heart of coal country in Kentucky. And that's the story that evolves. They had me, Ryan and Adam, brought me to Kentucky in June after the film was done. They said, how would you like to show this film to coal mining executives in Kentucky? I thought, oh my God, we will be in big <laughs> trouble. Um, so they organized screenings in Lexington and Louisville. They rented theaters in both cases, and particularly in Lexington, we were in coal country. Big strip mines to the west, big strip mines to the east. It's Mitch McConnell country, for God's sake, you know? Doesn't get any darker than that. So in this room in Lexington, it was a beautiful old Art Deco theater, and we had about 300 people from the local business community. And the guy who sponsored the night was the owner of the biggest uh, uh, coal mining equipment distributor in Kentucky. You know, all those huge trucks with the giant tires and mm -hmm. the drag lines and all that stuff. This guy sold all that. And he got up on the stage at the beginning and he said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Adam and Ryan here talked me into sponsoring this. 
And I wasn't sure what I was getting into. And I looked at the film for the first time two nights ago. <laughs> and I think you guys are in for a treat here. So just go for the ride and let's see. And I was sitting in the back of the auditorium as the film was playing and I still thought, oh God, when we go up on the stage, they're gonna throw tomatoes at us. We'll get a lot of harsh questions. And instead, we got a standing ovation. Wow. And Adam and Brian and I stood up there on the stage and I literally, my first question was back at the audience. When they handed me the microphone, I said, I, I'm, I'm astounded. I'm really, really grateful for the standing ovation, but help me understand. I don't understand why you guys are so excited about this film. Mm -hmm. And what I got right then and there from various audience members, as well as from the cocktail party afterwards, they said, you were respectful to us. You showed what the future needs to be, and we get that. And you did not portray us as a bunch of toothless, tobacco-spitting hillbillies. You showed us as real people and were, and, 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 and were decent to us, and we respect that. And we know we need to move off coal, we, but we believe it can't happen overnight. And um, so thank you for that. So that, that, in a lot of respects, was maybe the most profound reaction I've ever had from any audience about my work. I know that was a long story, but yeah. I thought it was worth telling. Yeah. That, that actually, uh, I'm, I'm happy you brought that up, uh, because I, so I have to say, I, I was fortunate enough to um, see the film before we got to talk to you, so we knew kind of what we could, uh, what we could mention. But I'm from, you go to the small town of Pennsylvania, I'm from about 20 minutes away from there. Like, I grew up there. And so I remember, like, if it popped on a screen, I was like, oh, my God, I know exactly where that is. And I wonder, it's, it's fantastic to hear these reactions um, when you were in Kentucky. Do you think, like, so if people maybe see your film or get to, get to talk to people about um, these, unfortunately, contentious issues, they might be receptive to it if treated in a certain way. But do you... Like, I just wonder if there's a barrier kind of to entry there. Like, what's the, I think the step might be missing, or if I wonder if you have any thoughts on this, is there a step missing to get those conversations to happen or to necessarily like see your film or even, you know what I mean? I just, I wonder if that's because like being from small, really small town Pennsylvania, even just broaching this subject is really difficult. And so I wonder how your experiences play on that. Did you actually grow up near Vintendale? I grew up, yeah, about 20, 20 minutes east of there in Crescent, Pennsylvania. You seem like such a reasonable guy. <laughs> this is why you I asked the question. Well. <laughs> some, some of us leave and do other things. Um. Uh, yeah, I mean, with, with any new message that has social and cultural implications, whether you're trying to sell a box of Tide detergent or a car or a bottle of beer or an idea, there are barriers to entry. That's why there are adverti advertising firms and marketing firms, because there's sure there's a lot of barriers to entry. We find that when we can put our stories in front of anybody, most people are intelligent and they're touched by human interest stories. Whether it's the human interest story of uh, our, my team and I running around on the Greenland ice sheet, or it's the stories that are in the human element. So that most of that film is a human interest story, right? So people relate to that, but the country is composed of 320 million people, more or less, and it's hard to get all the audiences you wish you could have in the room. That guy who lives down in that house down the street here, that, that big white house, um, <laughs> I would love to uh, get him in the room and show him this stuff. I don't think that a brain like that is changeable because he's impervious to truth, but still, I would relish the opportunity to speak with him and show him this work. Um, and I think um, we, we actually showed Chasing Ice in Congress, I think, three times. Wow. And, I, and I lectured to a whole bunch of con congressional staffers at one point. We were also in the White House in the executive office building had the entire science and technology and climate staff of the Obama administration, including the chief of staff in there. And we had great success with that. And so you, you love to have these influential audiences. And I have a meeting tomorrow that hopefully is going to lead to some more congressional screenings for, for the human element. But 
we, and we do every single thing we can to get in front of influencers, but there's barriers to entry. You know, there's just so much time. There's, there's so many opportunities. You do the best you can, and uh, you hope for the best. Um, and that, I think, is kind of a central point here. There's no silver bullet. There's no magic solution. There's no easy path. All of these changes have to be done in increments, you know, one by one by one. Even if you had uh, a different president in the White House and you were back to Obama or even Bush Cheney in the golden, beautiful years of Bush Cheney, that was way better than where we are now, believe me. Um, if you had those guys in the room and you persuaded them, they still can't unilaterally turn the course of history. They have a lot of other factors they have to work with. If you got the CEO of ExxonMobil in the room and you were able to persuade that person that you don't want to sell oil anymore, you want to sell solar panels, which of course would never happen. But if you did, the CEO of Exxon could not unilaterally say, okay, we're going a different way now. Because there's the electric grid, there's coal-fired power plants, there's car factories, there's the way cars are designed, there's the way GM works, there's the way Ford works. There's a lot of different moving parts to the social system. So all I can do, all the people like me can do, all any politician, in fact, can do is just keep moving the needle however you can move it. There's a famous quote from Gandhi that is enormously uh, inspiring and unsettling at the same time. And he said, everything you can do will seem insufficient, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. So there you are, you know? I just try and do what I perceive to be the right thing and go forward. Yeah. Right. So what is it now? I mean, because of these films and because of your work, you've almost become kind of a messenger of climate change, of you know the need for us to change and, and move in a new direction. And how has that affected you? I mean, have you really embraced that role? You seem to have embraced it, but is there any time where you're kind of wish that you could just be a nature photographer and live a quiet life somewhere. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like about every day. Yeah. Really. Yeah. No, it's it's I, I I feel like emotionally and I I often uh live in a somewhat conflicted state because there is a part of me that doesn't want to be in a in a fluorescent lit room like this. Would I rather be camping on a beach in Hawaii right now? You're damn straight. <laughs> You know, yeah. but this is my duty, and that that guy who camped on the beach in Hawaii—that was a guy from 30 or 40 years ago—and uh, it's my duty to be here now. Um, even though the Hawaiian beach would nurture my nerve endings better than those fluorescent lights do, but I I take great um, nourishment and personal inspiration from feeling like this work has meaning and the, meet, the work has purpose. And um, there's, there, was a, there was a theme I touched on. I didn't use this word, but I was right close to it. There was a theme I touched on in the show when I was talking about my grandfather, the coal miner. There's a question of doing honorable work. And that's what I was trying to get at, talking about the coal miner or a man who works on an oil rig or whatever. It's honorable work. And I feel like the work we're doing is honorable work. The work you're doing is honorable work. And this notion of honor and duty isn't something that we easily talk about in modern society, especially liberal intelligentsia society. It's a word that the military has captured, and it's used for all that jingoistic, um, militaristic stuff. It's part of the, uh, the, the, the Marine Corps mottos or whatever, you know? But the word honor and duty, the, the words honor and duty matter, you know? And we need to uh, respect and celebrate uh, those kinds of honorable and, and duty-driven choices more often in, in the way we think about things. Well, that's all, folks. That's all. Yeah. I love James. I, yeah, this was, this was such a great... Uh, such a great opportunity we're so happy that we had um this chance to to do this and we hope that all of you enjoyed listening to this lauren is literally like smiling i am Very because giddy. i just can't believe that i got to meet him and <laughs> hug him and 
I'm a little embarrassed about some of the things I asked and the looks, he, the crazy looks he gave me. Sure. <laughs> like I had five heads, but it was sure. all worth it. 100%. Yeah. The the my crowning achievement was when we were talking about rural Pennsylvania. About he was like thinking about doing projects and. Yeah, it comes up to me and like hands me his card. Like, hey, get in touch with me about it. Was so awesome. Experience. It was pretty awesome. I was really jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to lie. All right. Well, that's all we have from the third pod from the sun. Thanks so much to you guys, Lauren and Shane, Yay. for doing this interview. And of course, to James for sharing his his work, his story, his life with story with us. Yeah. So this podcast is also produced with help from Josh Beiser, Olivia Ambrosio, Liza Lester, and Katie Brundle. And thanks to Kayla Surrey for producing this episode. So if you love this podcast, please, you know you yes, rate and review us on iTunes. It really helps people to find the podcast when you do that. Of course, you can listen to us wherever you get your podcasts and always at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all. And we'll see you next time.